Hello and welcome to the Strigen Wednesday webinars. If you're joining us for the first time, this is a community initiative by Strigen Technologies, where you can tune into a variety of sessions across the fields of technology, entrepreneurship, and community building. For today's session, we have with us Matt Brunty, who will take us through a session on storytelling through code. We take a look at the role of BDD in development, writing great user stories, and automating them in BHAT. Before we get started with the session, I would request all participants to please type in any questions that you have during the session and we'll take them up in the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Also, don't forget to take the conversation live on Twitter using our hashtag SriginWW. You can share your thoughts by tagging us using our handle at the rate Srijan and at the rate Brunty. So are you ready? Let's dive in. Matt, over to you. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Um, as I've been introduced, my name is Matt. Um, I'll be dealing with um, sort of talking you through behavior-driven development. We'll go through at the end uh, a little bit of how to automate these things that we've learned in BHAT, which is uh, a tool to help us facilitate behavior-driven development. Um, and we'll go through this, the sort of the process of um, how we can tell a user story through code, and how we can write a good story, what differentiates a good story to a bad story. Um, and hopefully by the end of it you'll have something to take away where you can actually go ahead and start implementing these uh, techniques and these tools in your uh, in your day-to-day -day workflows and at the end of it um, you know have very successful um, well-built software so just to kick it off um, I'm a senior software engineer at a company called Viva IT um, we do BDD sort of day in day out yeah, and we sort of live and breathe it um, when we sort of came around to doing it it, it it really did change the way we built software, um, and it meant that the software we was we were building um, worked out much better for the purposes that it was going for. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Brunty. If you've got any questions you'd like to ask, feel free to drop me a message. Um, happy to talk about it. Um, I'm also an organizer for a PHP programming group in the Midlands in the UK called PHP's Midlands, and we hold monthly meetups. You know, similar to the sort of thing we get together um, and we have a talk around. Uh, PHP topic or related web topic, you know, something that's sort of close to home for us sort of web developers. So before we talk about behavior-driven development um, and sort of dive in sort of deep with, with what that means, um, we'll quickly talk about sort of the testing side of, uh, of software, um, software development. Um, I know sort of in the previous talks I've given, um, a lot of people they they test their code, they'll but they'll write their tests after they've written the code. They'll write the code, then they'll write some tests to verify that the code is doing what it should be. And that, that can work and that's okay. But as soon as you tell people to start writing tests before they write the code, kind of the, the barriers go up and they get very not defensive, but they get scared that oh I I can't do that. That's you know that's that's too much hard work. I I don't understand all of these things to sort of, you know to go through. So as part of this talk and as part of this presentation I hope to sort of show you that writing effectively tests before you write code isn't such a scary thing and can actually be done by pretty much anyone. So we'll consider test driven development versus behavior driven development and a lot of people wonder you know if they are the same um, and they are the same in some ways um, they do differ in other ways Behavior-driven development as a sort of a whole is for a much broader audience than what test-driven development is for. Test-driven development is very much focused on the developers and what the developers are doing and what the code that we are doing, you know, how it performs and, and how it works. And that's great, but that doesn't factor in all the other people that are involved within the software development process. Behavior-driven development helps us think about you know the broader audience and the other people who are who are involved with this process because it's not just the programmers writing the code that make a piece of software great and behavior driven, behavior driven development helps us focus on the higher level business value um, of the software that we're that we're building so people often say that BDD is TDD done right some people get offended by this because they think that if they're performing test-driven development, it's not actually correct. But that's that's not what this means. What this means is that if you're doing test-driven development correctly, effectively you're doing behavior-driven development. It's you know it's just an extension of it. 
test driven development sort of causes developers to look at how much the you know how things are working from the how that how it works you know how does this piece of code talk to that piece of code they don't always think about the why they're building that piece of code or you know what the, the larger feature is that they're building and they can lose sight of that business value um, of the of the thing that they're building and that's where sort of behavior driven development steps in is, is you can still do the test driven development but we're going to make you consider the, the you know the larger value in what it is you're working on there's a business value behind this feature um, and we're sort of you know making sure that you're constantly aware of that so test driven development is building the thing right it's making sure that the thing you're building is built correctly using you know best practices well built code well structured code and you know that's that's how that focuses on it whereas behavior driven development is making sure that you're building the right thing you know you could build the most amazing piece of you know perfectly structured code under the surface but it doesn't mean you've built a feature that's actually achieving what the business set out to do so if you consider it in sort of a really short way test driven development is how you're building something and behavior driven development is why you're building something and that that's often a really important part that people don't generally consider. So let's get into sort of the behavior driven development side of this. Um, behavior driven development, it specifies that any test or sort of you know, unit of code or software, um, it should be described in terms of the behavior of it. How does it behave? Um, and in sort of this example, behavior consists of the requirements set by the business. Um, so the behavior has some sort of business value behind it. From you know whoever commissioned this piece of work, be it you know another company or you know part of your internal team, and it doesn't really focus too much on what's going on under the surface. It just says I need to achieve this value. How you do that is up to you, but this value needs to be achieved. And because of this, it's often considered what's called an outside-in activity, meaning that you don't care too much what's happening inside the code. You're just an outsider looking into it, saying yeah that that's that's doing what I expected to do. Um, from a programming perspective, there's two main types of behavior-driven development. One of them is scenario BDD, and it looks at you know examples and the higher level stuff. And then there's specification or spec BDD. Um, spec BDD is more akin to sort of test-driven development and the low-level how the code works side of things. Um, we're not going to be focusing on that. We'll be focusing on um, scenario BDD. So. With scenario BDD, it it doesn't care too much about how the code works under the surface. That's what spec BDD can do. Scenario BDD, you know, it just cares about the the value and the rules that you're adhering to. It doesn't really mind about the implementation under the surface. So here's a quote from a guy called Dan North. And Dan North is the, the the guy who came up with BDD. He sort of you know established all of this. And he considers BDD to be a second generation outside in, pool based, multiple stakeholder, multiple scale, high automation, agile methodology. Now, that's a long quote. Don't worry, there won't be a pop quiz at the end where you know you're asked what this, this quote is all about. But there's a few key parts in this that are really important to understanding why you do BDD and why it's valuable. So we'll break it down into a few parts. It's considered second generation because it didn't try to replace test-driven development. It was born from test-driven development. It's the next generation of how it does things. It took the things that we learned with test-driven development and it built upon them and improved upon them and said, you know what, we can do this a little bit better in these other ways. And you know, that's that's helped us establish, okay, we can now get you know a bit more value in what we're doing. It's a multiple stakeholder methodology because BDD sort of gets rid of the idea that it's a single person using or building or representing the system. It seeks to represent multiple users, multiple groups of people, anyone who's a stakeholder within the software, and a stakeholder in this case is not necessarily someone who's got money in it. Um, if you're a developer building the software, you're a stakeholder in that piece of software. If you're the designer who builds the interfaces for that piece of software, you're a stakeholder the project manager, the product owner, the CEO who's paying for all of this, they are a stakeholder. All of these people have an opinion and a say in how the software is built because they all are involved in the software. They've all got some sort of investment in it. And because of this, it helps us to keep in mind who's using the system because the users of the system are considered a stakeholder within this as well. 
if I'm building a point of sale system to go into a shop, you know, the person who uses that day to day to scan barcodes on items through the checkout, they're a stakeholder in the system. They've got to use this day to day. So they've got probably one of the most important roles because they use this day to day. They know what makes this work and what doesn't. So it helps you focus on actually there's more people involved than just me as a developer. And it's an agile methodology because the way BDD works and the way the conversations you have sort of evolve, it really works well with very short iterations um, in the software release process. It works really well with you know short sprints and releasing software frequently and often and getting feedback on whether you've delivered the value that you set out to achieve with you know behavior driven development. And if it doesn't, then you can iterate on it and move on. Um, and it requires a lot of sort of that collaboration that comes with Agile, and that's where you get the best results from this. So just to sort of reiterate the point, multiple stakeholders are, they are crucial to doing behavior driven development. You know, when you talk with multiple stakeholders and you talk with lots of people, you establish a common language to use, you know, amongst everyone really. So you all start referring to the same concepts and the same things within your sort of business domain as the same words. And that could be really important to helping drive, you know, better software. You get into the behavior driven development side of software from that um, and the domain driven development side of software from that. But it also just makes communication easier because you're all using the same terms and you understand what it is you're doing. So because of this, conversations are absolutely key. Um, the, the person who wrote um, BHAP, um, Everzet or Constantin, it, he had a tweet once that said, if you're not having discussions you're not doing BDD and if you know if your if your development isn't the result of those discussions you're not doing BDD and if it doesn't use you know drive the development from that you're not doing test driven development so if you're just using a tool like BHAT to write tests but you're not speaking to anyone you're not performing BDD because you're not talking about the things you're doing because it's so collaborative because it's got the multiple stakeholders it requires you to have these conversations so when we get on to sort of you know developers we you know we love these sorts of things so it's hard to work out how we work with this but the most important part is that you've got to have the conversations first and then when you have those conversations that's more important than capturing those conversations you can't capture and when i say capture i mean you know write down and, and store them somewhere you can't capture those conversations if you're not having them and you can't automate those conversations um, in the tools that, that are available to you until you've captured them. So you can't go to automating the conversations if you haven't captured them, but you can't capture them if you've not had them. So the most, in, you know, the first step in all of this is have the conversations. If you don't have them, you can't implement them and automate them under the surface. You need to have these conversations before you start writing code. So when you're having these conversations, you're, start, you're talking about, you know, the process that a user takes through your system. Um, you're talking about the steps they take, what the story is for them using your system, where they start, where they end, what they expect to experience in the middle, and what value has been achieved before that. And you need to do this before you start writing code, because this, that journey that the user is taking doesn't, doesn't matter on code. It's, it's a business value and a business rule that's being implemented here. It's just an implementation detail. It could work anywhere else as well. You then need to capture them so you can drive the development because if you don't capture them, you can't then use them to automate, but you need to capture them so that they've sort of, you know, an established common language and everyone can refer back to them. And from that, you can then use them to drive development. Um, a lady called Liz Keogh, um once said that BDD is the art of using examples in conversations to illustrate behavior. And when you're talking through these conversations and you're having these conversations with other people, Often you'll find yourself talking in examples. And these examples are examples of stories that you've encountered with, you know, how a user's interacted with your system previously. So you might say, you know, um, oh, I, I, I heard about this the other day, and this, this is what we experienced. And you talk through the story of, of what that person experienced through the process of doing this with the software. And you can then use that in your software to actually illustrate what the software should or should not be doing. Um, and that's a really important thing because in sort of the BDD world, examples are really essential to what you do. Um, they remove a lot of the ambiguity around um, you know, rules that might be imposed on a system. So, for example, 
if a shop has a 10% discount for students and a student goes in to buy an item and it costs £10 and then they get it for £9, that's 10% off. But if there was already a discount of 50% on that item and it now costs £5, they now pay £4.50 or does that discount override the other discount? If you're just given a rule such as students get a discount, that doesn't sort of explain all the nuances and all the other different scenarios that have happened through the system. So when you talk with examples, you can start getting down, you know, real world numbers and real world values. And that helps you sort of get a more rounded opinion and a more rounded idea of what it is you're working with. You're less likely to make assumptions and you're less likely to make mistakes in the code that you're building because you've done it based on real world conversations and real world examples that you've had with people. So this is great and it's all very, you know, nice and we can talk about it a lot. But, you know, the next thing developers ask is, okay, so how do I work with this? This sounds great, you know, I'm having all these conversations and I'm talking to people, but I'm not writing any code. How do I actually, you know, deal with this day to day? So there's a tool called BHAT in PHP that helps us work with BDD and helps us, you know, facilitate the automation of these conversations for the software we're building. And a lot of people that I know who have worked with BDD, their first encounter with all of this was using BHAT as a, a browser, because you can use it to drive browsers and go to URLs and click on buttons and you know click on links and all that sort of thing. And that was their first encounter with this. No, nothing wrong with that, but then when you realize actually there's a lot more power behind this tool than just you know automating a browser. So we actually work with this in a thing called Gherkin, and it's called Gherkin DSL. DSL stands for Domain Specific Language. It's like a, a language they've written um, that allows you to write files that you can then, you know, as part of your capturing the conversation process, you can write these files, and then from them you can automate the implementation of those. It's human readable, and it, you know, it lets you describe behavior without going into detail about how it works under the surface. So we'll go with, you know, some important parts here. Gherkin is human readable. Um, it's because of that you can get pretty much anyone involved with the writing and the reading of these files. When you consider test-driven development, often the code under the surface that's powering test-driven development, a manager or you know a product owner or someone non-technical might not understand this as well as a developer because it's hard to read. You've got to understand code to understand what's going on. Whereas because Gherkin is human readable. Anyone can get involved with this, and anyone can, you know, approach this. Gherkin and the, well, tools especially can have multilingual support. Um, if you need to write things in different languages, they all support this. Um, some of them have even got languages, you know, such as Pirate. If you wanted to write stuff as if you were a pirate, that can be done. Gherkin is a keyword-based language, and because of this, there's a few keywords that we'll get onto in a, a bit later. Um, but these keywords allow us to sort of specify things that should be happening or will be happening uh, when we're automating these conversations and dealing with them in code. It's also line oriented. So if anyone's ever written something like YAML, um, it's a bit like that uh, in some ways. Um, you know, new lines are actually a, a new thing to happen. Um, if you're not, they're not separated by you know curly braces or semicolons. It's it's a new line thing. That's that's how it works. But more importantly than all this, Gherkin is the documentation for your system. Now, <laughs> I know most developers don't write documentation for their system, or it's considered as, considered as an afterthought, and because of that you have to go back and try and work out what it's actually doing. But because you've had these conversations about what the software should be doing before it's actually built, and they're in a human readable format, it forms really good documentation for how it behaves and the types of things it can do without you having to put in any extra effort other than just talk about it up front. So that's a really nice thing because for developers it becomes documentation. Well, what, it should, what should it be doing? That's you know really handy. I can look at, read, read through these feature files, see what the software is doing without having to you know, worry about what's going on under the surface. And of course, Gherkin allows automation. So you can use these files as a developer to automate the tests within your system. Um, you can be, you know, do them in the knowledge that what you're building is the right thing for the right business value and you can have that bit more confidence that what you're doing is actually going to be worth it. 
And, you know, as we know, developers love automation. You know, we'll spend hours writing something that, you know, reduces time by five seconds if we can because we love automating that sort of thing. So, we're going to get on to writing stories. What's involved with writing a story? Now, when you're writing these stories, you need to be descriptive. And this sort of comes back to the examples. When you're having the conversations, people generally aren't all that vague in conversation. They talk about you know, concrete things and examples. So use those in the stories that you're writing to be descriptive about what the software should be doing. You don't want to be overly vague about it because if, if you're overly vague about it, it kind of becomes hard to establish what, what is this actually doing? What's the value that's being achieved here? And the features that you're writing, these are your stories. These are the things, you know, the user stories and the user journeys through your system. You have a single feature per file when you're writing these stories. They go in a dot feature file notation for Gherkin and you write a single feature per each one of those files. And as an example, a lot of people might write a feature file like this. Um, if anyone's seen the as a I want so that format before, it's pretty much here. It's as a role, so this is the person I'm playing within the story of this system. I want and, the fe and then the feature that you're implementing. What is it you're doing? And then you've got so that benefit. And the benefit is kind of what they're trying to achieve. What's the business value behind this thing that we're doing? And I, that, that to me is the most important part. The benefit kind of shows me, okay, this tells me why I'm doing this. I know I've got context now to what I'm doing. And because of that, I've got a much bigger appreciation for the impact that my feature might be having. So further to this, what a lot of people you know, have, have done is said, you know, that, that so that benefit is, it's kind of, it doesn't belong at the end. That's the important part. It, you know, that's the important part to this. So what we'll do, uh, Liz Keo sort of specified, this is the way to write it, is, you know, in order to achieve value, that's the important part here. This is the value. So let's put that first. Let's not make it the last thing to be considered. Let's put it first in that line. And then subconsciously, that's the first thing we think about when we think about this feature. So in order to achieve value as a role, I want feature. The other two lines, you know, pretty much the same. But it's the in order to achieve value, that's the key part to all of this for developers. Now, within a feature, we have scenarios. And a scenario describes a situation to test within our, our feature file. And scenarios are the examples that I've mentioned previously. Scenarios, um, they are the, 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 the values that you're using and the things that should take place and what should happen within your system for a thing to, uh, to occur. And because of these, the examples are absolutely essential to telling this story. These are the examples you've spoken about in these conversations. You've spoken to people and they've said, yeah, this is what happened in this example. And you use that to drive the system so that the system is based on those real world examples. And they are absolutely essential in what you're doing. Features can have multiple scenarios, so within a single feature file you can talk about multiple examples as long as they sort of, you know, pertain to the right feature and the same thing. And within that, a scenario has steps, and steps are, they sort of the detail, and they, they detail each action and each thing that should happen within an example. They have some sort of important keywords, and I'll go through those uh, as previously mentioned with the Gherkin, sort of being a keyword-based language. And of course, like a feature file can have multiple scenarios to test multiple things. A, scenarios has, a scenario has multiple steps. You know, multiple things have to happen to go from the, um, you know, the, the, the start to the end of this story that you're telling. What did we start with? How have we ended up? What's the, 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 what are the steps that we've gone through to achieve that? So steps being keyword based, we've got a few important keywords in Gherkin. Um, if anyone's dealt with any of this stuff before, they might be familiar to you. Which puts the system into a known state. This is, you know, this is your setup. If anyone's done test-driven development before, you may have heard of the phrase assemble, act, assert. Assemble being, you know, put the system into a known state. Because if we're going to be performing actions on this system and be describing the behavior, if we don't start at the same point, the behavior at the end might not be the same. So we can't really test that. So given puts the system into a known state that we can then work with because it's you know a solid and established thing. When describes the action that we're doing. This is the key thing that's that's being tested effectively. So this is you know this is um, adding the product to the basket or, or anything like that. It's the key thing that we're dealing with in our our, our test. 
although behavior-driven development doesn't particularly refer to things as tests. And then is the observable outcome. This is what should have happened based on the behavior that we've seen. So given we've put the system into a known state, when we take an action, then we should see some sort of observable outcome and be able to establish that, that outcome is what we expect to happen. So as a you know very basic example here, um, we've got you know adding a product to a basket. So given I have a large t-shirt product that sets me up in a known state. If I didn't have that state, when you know, and I say when I add a large t-shirt to my basket, did, did, was there one in stock? You know, did we have one of those? That puts us into sort of a known state. The when is the key action, so this is us adding the product to our basket. And the then is basically the assertion and making sure that, yeah, we, we do have a large t-shirt in the basket that we're, that we're dealing with. There's a couple more keywords that are useful for sort of the readability of the files that we deal with. We can have and, which allows us to add extra steps within, um, within any one of those previous steps that we've had. And there's also but, which essentially performs the same as and, but from a, a human readable perspective, it's got a different meaning, so it helps read better in sort of the conversational aspect of all this. So this is an example where we've got, you know, a few more steps here. So given I have a large t-shirt that costs £9.99 and I have an empty basket and I am a tax exempt customer, when I do this action, then I should have the product in my basket. The basket total should be the amount, but I should not have tax applied to my order. And the and and the but, under the surface, they basically perform the same way, they do the same thing, but they perform, you know, from a human aspect, they, they read slightly differently and it gives us a little more context into what we're doing. So when we're talking about sort of our storage structure and how we're, you know, the makeup of a feature file, what does a full feature file look like? There's a short example, I can show you one in sort of a live demonstration a bit later. Um, but the makeup of a feature file looks a bit like this. this. This could contain more scenarios for the sake of space. I haven't really got any more on here at the minute. But the whole thing is considered our feature. This is everything. This is the feature. This is all the scenarios. That's the feature we're dealing with. Within that, we have the actual scenario itself. This is you know, the example that we're testing um, within our, our feature file. And then within that, we have the step. And the step is the action or the, uh, the step that enables that scenario to, to occur. That's the basic makeup of what a feature file looks like. And again, this is great. We've gone through this, but you know, I'm a developer, for example. You know, but how do I actually, how do I actually get stuck in with this? What's the code I'm writing under the surface? At the minute, we haven't, you know, we haven't got to any code. What's, what's, how does it all relate? So in BHAP and with Gherkin, we have a thing called a step definition. And what a step definition is, those steps that we mentioned previously. A step definition allows you to map that step to an executable piece of code. So, for example, that line at the top there, given I have a large t-shirt product, what that does, when I run it under the surface, that will match this annotation in PHP that, you know, will then run this function within a, a class that I've got. And that's really nice because it now means, well, I can actually, you know, do things with code based on that, um, based on that, that step definition. And what you might have noticed in here is that the, the actual method that I'm calling it has an argument. And what arguments allow me to do is effectively replace values. So given I have a colon product, that's like our placeholder. And whatever gets put in there will then, when the step definition runs, be put into the variable product for us. And what that means is I can now take values from you know, my feature files and actually work with them in code, which is really handy. Further to this, what I can then do is I can transform those values. And what transformers allow you to do is abstract away sort of common operations performed on arguments. Um, so a very simple one could be if I've got a count of a number, everything in BHAP would come through as a string, and actually I want the integer value of that number. So any what this will do is any time it sees the colon count placeholder, it will run this function to you know change that value from what it was before to something afterwards and then pass it into the um, the step definition so if I had to do something that relied on this being an integer I could now do that inside my step definition without having to cast it to an integer every single time I wanted to use it within within my my feature files and my step definitions it saves me a lot of writing you know little bits of code just to make life a little bit easier as a developer 
They can obviously be much more advanced. So this is a much more advanced example. But essentially what it's doing is when I give it a colon product, which basically says um, replace this string. So that might be my product name. And it will then change that product name into an entity. So it goes and looks in the database for that product. If it doesn't find it, it will throw an exception. But if it does, it returns it to me. And then in my step definition, I'm no longer working with just a string for the product name. I'm working with an actual product entity or an object. And that can allow me a lot more flexibility and a lot more power in writing really good step definitions under the surface. Now, with all of this as well, tools often allow you to have tags. And what tags allow you to do is change up the way that step definitions work. Um, you can do things like, if I specify that this scenario is at domain and at web UI, this scenario will run in a feature file, sorry, in a, a configuration sort of profile that allows me to specify I want to look at domain ones. The syntax here is a little bit confusing. I'll go through it in an actual example later. It's easier to explain there. But effectively, it allows me to sort of categorize my scenarios and then run them in different ways if I want to later on. We can also hook into the test process. So hooks um, you can run sort of before and after suites or features and scenarios and steps. Um, and effectively, BHAT as a tool would run this hook or the hook that you specified um, in whichever way you want. So if you, for example here, um, before I run a scenario, so before an example or a test runs, this is effectively just going to reset my database. So if I'm talking to a database in my test, I might need my database to be in a, a known format before, um, before each test. And if I've already got items in my database from a previous test and I run another test and it hasn't been, well now my database is sort of, it's, it's polluted from my previous test and I don't want that. So uh, you know, a scenario like this would allow you to effectively just clear the database out and, and reset it before you get started onto the next test. And with all of this, we can configure them with sweeteners and profiles. And what this does is this allows us the ability to run, you know, feature files with different step definitions or, you know, uh, the same sort of criteria with different implementations. Um, and it's really powerful because you can test different figure features with different configurations, all the same features. And depending on how your tests are related to, you know, the environment that you're running in, you can change the way they run. You can use the same feature files or you can use different feature files. And with these feature files, you can test different implementations, which is a really handy thing. So as a, I'll go through this in the demo um, in a bit, which is a lot easier to see in sort of action. But under the surface, you could have one sort of scenario. Um, and this scenario has a number of different step definitions it can run based on the, the sort of the feature or the suite that I'm running. So this scenario, you know, given there is a product which costs price, that could effectively, um, you know, in this case, it puts a product into the database. It persists it to the database and, you know, flushes it off to the database. And that's what it does in this example. But in a different example, if I don't care about testing the database and I just want to test the code works under the surface, I could assign it to you know, an in-memory array, which is a lot faster because I don't have to touch a database. Ultimately, this, this uh, scenario and the example that's being used hasn't changed. It's just the implementation that's changed under the surface. The business rule doesn't care whether the product is put in a database or not. It just cares that this has happened. And that's the crucial part to this. So in our example, we can have a different UI suite than as you know, domain or a service layer suite, and they can test different things. So you know, when I add it to the basket, if I'm dealing with my domain under the surface and I don't really care too much about the UI, I can just call the add to product method on a basket object, and that will test that the basket add to basket method is working. Whereas through a UI or on the internet, you know, or through a browser uh, over an internet connection, I might want to test it through a browser. So if I was running it in a browser sort of you know browser-based environment. I could visit a URL and I could press the button to say add to basket and that's how I would do it through a browser. But ultimately the business value that's here is adding a product to the basket. It doesn't matter whether you add it via a, you know, a web UI or via the domain layer under the surface. The general concept and the core value that we're looking at hasn't changed, only the implementation has. A way to think about this is, you know, 
if, if I was doing this through an app, I could also test it with this because I'm adding it to the basket. I could have a different context that loaded a different uh, environment that loaded up an application or you know a mobile application and clicked a button there. It doesn't have to visit a web browser or go to a page. It you know interacts with a native app. And because of these sweet syntax, you can sort of the implementation you can change um, without changing your documented business rules. And that's where the power lies in such a system. Um, because if, if we, anyone who's sort of worked in industry for any time knows that the implementation of anything changes a lot more frequently than the business rules. The business rules do change, and I'm not saying that they don't change, but the implementation changes a lot more frequently than a business rule would change. So with this in mind, this helps us sort of formulate how we write a good story and how we tell a bad story from a good story. A lot of this is, is, is avoided by having the conversations you, uh, you should be having before you write the code, but it can be easy to slip into bad habits. So this story here, it says, I can add a product to my basket. And it says, given I'm on the product page, when I press add to basket, then I should see PlayStation 4 and I should see 250 pounds. And this is a bad story. It would work, and we can implement this under the surface, and it would test the things that we want to test. But inherently, it's not a good story. A better way of writing this story, and the way it probably should be written, I'm not saying this is a perfect example, but it's a better way of doing it, is, you know, given I have a PlayStation 4 that costs £250, when I add the PlayStation 4 to my basket, then I should have one product in my basket, and the basket total should be £250. What this allows me to do is specify there's no implementation in here. I'm not going at this through a browser. I'm just explaining the business rules and the business value that I'm trying to achieve with this product, with this uh, scenario. And this is a better story. A way to kind of look at this is, if we're talking about that previous example that was a bad example, what would happen when that add to basket button changes to say add to cart? You know, so one of the designers comes back and says, you know, we've been doing some testing and the add to basket button isn't, you know, isn't the right way of wording it. So we've decided to change it to say add to cart. Well, now, potentially, if you've written a test that relies on that, bu that button saying add to basket, your test is going to break. But the business value of what's being achieved here hasn't changed. The business value is the product is added to the basket. It doesn't matter whether it's added via a button that says add to basket or one that says add to cart. It doesn't matter at all. So the biggest thing for this is to not write implementation in features. Um, that's avoided by having conversations before you write code. But it can be you know, very easy to slip into the habit of putting implementation in features because we are web developers and we think about browsers and we think about UI and that's the way we sort of think about the systems. So I'm gonna jump off of here and I'm just gonna uh, show you a quick demo of how this works um, in an actual code level. So here I've got a feature file that's probably very similar to the, the ones you've, um, you've seen already. And what this feature file is doing is, you know, it's adding products to a basket. Um, and I can run this and my tests run based on this feature file. All of this is configured for BHAP. This won't be sort of a hugely in-depth dive into BHAP because there's a lot of options, but it's just to kind of, you know, whet the appetite and, and get things ready so that you can go and take this, you know, to the next step. So BHAP is configured by a BHAP.yaml file. And the YAML file allows us to define our suites. So as I mentioned earlier with our suites and profiles, I can have a number of different suites configured that can do different things. So if I've got a domain suite, this allows me to look at anything that's tagged at domain. And this syntax basically means I want everything that's tagged with domain and with this, these two ampersands here, and is not with the tilde tagged work in progress and is not in progress. So anything that's not tagged as work in progress will be run when this suite is run. And BHAT uses something called a context. And the context is um, how, the, uh, how the code should run. This is kind of the, the environment the code should run in, if you like. And then from this, I've got a web UI suite down here, which can test things through a browser. And this loads a different set of contexts. So this allows me to do the context switching, the environment switching that allows me to test the same feature file with different sets of code under the surface. And then 
I've got one, you know, for my, my work in progress that looks for work in progress things. Um, we've got some other stuff for JavaScript, which allows us to run it through Selenium, which is an actual browser that can fire up and run JavaScript. By default, the default browser, which is uh, Mink for Behat, um, doesn't actually use JavaScript. So if you've got UI elements that rely on JavaScript being run, um, they won't actually run through Mink. You would need to run them either in a JavaScript-based browser or you know something like Selenium. So what this means is, if I run this feature file, I can run it with different sort of contexts under the surface. I've got a couple of helper scripts here that allow me to just you know run um, the code under the surface. But when I was to run this, effectively in my domain context, if I look at this step here for given there is a PlayStation 4 and I look at it in my domain context, as per the slide earlier in the example, I'm adding it to an in-memory array because I'm, this is, I'm testing my sort of domain layer code under the surface. I don't care that it's implemented through a browser or whether it's through an API or if it's a command line tool. I don't care about that. I'm testing the core code logic that makes up my system and that's how I'm testing it. So that this uh, BHAT domain um, will run the domain suite which loads these uh, step definitions here. Um, and it means that I can test the domain layer code under the surface. So if I run this, it takes a little bit of time. But effectively, there we go. What it's going to do is it's going to run through my scenarios and test them with that code under the surface. Now it's run those three scenarios because they're all tagged with at domain, as you can see here. And it's tested them with my, my code under the surface. And that tells me that my domain layer code is working as well. I have another that will allow me to test it through a web UI. And what this does is if I go to my web UI context, this is actually loading a browser um, in the background. It's using a, what's called a headless browser, so there's no sort of user interface. But effectively, I'm navigating a browser. I'm visiting URLs as per this visit, and I'm pressing buttons. And then when, later on, you know, when I'm saying I should have a number of products in the basket, I'm asserting that elements on the page come back with a certain, you know, uh, certain value, that side of things. It really helps with that sort of thing. So if I run this web UI suite, it's going to run the same three scenarios because they're all tagged with web UI. But it's going to run them through a browser instead, um, which allows me to test that, you know, the actual browser interaction is working as well. That's the kind of thing you can test with this, and you probably want to as well. You don't want to write too many of these tests or web UI and sort of UI specific, and browser specific tests because they are a lot slower. What you may have noticed is that it's run in 15 seconds where my previous one ran in four and this one ran three and this one ran in only two because I've not looked at the JavaScript one and it ran in 15 seconds. And now further to this, if I switch to my terminal here, I can actually sort of show that this is under the surface, this does actually um, it does run things. Now this window here is a virtual, um, uh, it's basically a, it's a Docker container, but it's, it's running Selenium. And what Selenium is, is it's a browser that you can automate tests with. Um, you can talk to it in you know, specific languages and uh, tell it to do various things. And behind the scenes, there's a driver for BHAT that allows me to talk to a browser and it will drive Selenium. So if I run, I run my JavaScript test suite, and we look at this window, what's gonna happen is you see a Selenium window pop up, it will load the product page, it will click and add to basket button, and it will verify. So now we've seen the browser has appeared, the product page has appeared, the basket button has been clicked, and then it will assert that the basket contains the values, and it's exited, and it's, you know, everything's green. So that's just a really cool, sort of quick demo of, uh, of how BHAT can actually be used to implement these, these features. It can be done on, you know, a, a full load up a full browser. That was a full instance of Chrome that works with JavaScript and all that side of things, and it can do that, or it could just drive a browser onto the surface, or it can just test the code level if you want to. So, in summary, to all of this, conversations. <laughs> There's, you need to have lots of them. You need to talk through the things you're doing. They are utterly crucial to what to what's sort of at the heart of behavior-driven development. You need to have your stories told by real-world examples. So when you're having these conversations, talk about the stories that the users have encountered by the real-world examples that have actually happened. 
Use those user stories as the requirements that you're building your system towards. You need to involve multiple stakeholders to the software that you're building. Get a lot of, you know, get as many people involved as need to be to make sure that you know this feature is covered by everyone who's affected by this. You need to write those features before you write code. And you need to write them without implementation, which is a lot easier to do if you write them before you write the code. So at the beginning of the story that you're telling, you have the conversation and you capture that conversation. In the middle, you automate and implement that conversation. And at the end, you have happy stakeholders and you have well-built software. And it works and it works well and I do it day to day and the stuff that I do generally comes out as, you know what, that's pretty spot on because I've talked about it and we've been speaking about what I'm building. The slides are online for this. I'll uh, get a link tweeted out to them. There's a lot of blogs here to go and read if you want to look any further. People I would recommend to sort of follow for this sort of thing. Dan North and Liz Keogh are, you know, they are two sort of top level people within the behavior driven development uh, community. They are incredibly smart, incredibly good at what they do. Um, Invika is another great company for this sort of thing. You're free to come and talk to me about any of this. Thank you for listening to me talk about this and ramble on for 45 minutes. Um, you can reach me at, at Bronte on Twitter. You feel free to email me um, at uh, matt at mfyu.co.uk. Um, if you've got any questions, anything you want me to talk through, I'm happy to go through that. Thank you for listening. All right. Um, thank you very much, Matt. So that, that was a great session and really detailed. Uh, so um, I would just like to repeat for all our audience here that if you have any questions, now would be the time to put them in. And I'm taking up the questions that we do have right now with Matt. So the first question we have here is that is we had a DSL uh, like Gherkin and what is the difference between we had and Gherkin? Okay, um, Gherkin is the language that we use in the feature files. Um, if my screen's still being shared, this is uh, a feature file here. So this is Gherkin, this language here with you know scenarios given when then. Um, Bhat is not Gherkin, but Bhat uses Gherkin. So Bhat is a tool that wraps Gherkin and allows us to work with Gherkin in PHP. Um, Gherkin is a part of sort of the larger community of BDD tools. Um, there's a spec called Cucumber. Um, lots of food related names, um, but effectively bhat uses Gherkin um, and bhat is the PHP implementation that uses Gherkin for behavior driven development. So they're quite closely related, but they are not one and the same effectively. Uh, does that answer the question? Uh, yes, that does. Um, the next question that we have is, uh, can you have more than one feature in a file or is it recommended to have only one feature per file? It's you could do, but you. Well, I, I think the spec actually only allows you to have one feature element within a file. Um, if you could do, I would always recommend against it. Um, the reason being is that it, for the most part, it's an organizational thing. You know, you can put these features um, in two folders. So I've got an add to basket feature here within a basket folder. Another feature might be remove from basket or update basket. Those could be additional files within this folder. So it's just to kind of structure them in a logical way that makes sense for your, you know, for your software. Um, if you could put two feature files in a file, I would always recommend against it. I would not recommend doing it because then you end up with, you know, one massive feature file that contains every single feature in your software. It becomes difficult to maintain, becomes difficult to read. Um, so I would always recommend, you know, keep your feature files concise to what they need to be doing. Uh, all right. In follow up to that question itself, so do you nest the scenarios under one feature? Like if they're relating to the, let's say, same feature, would you nest the scenarios under one thing? Yes. So if I quickly just delete this for you to show you, um, feature is kind of like the root level element here up at the top. And then within that, you nest the scenario under the feature and you nest the steps under the scenario. Um, effectively, that's yes, it's, it's nested. The feature is the, you know, the root level element. Scenarios are below that and steps are below those. Um, so yeah, effectively it's nesting. Right, great. Uh, so the thing that you presented in the end, the three steps, those have been getting a lot of uh, uh, positive response from all our audience saying that, that that was a really good way to put everything together. And uh, post that, uh, we have how does we had compared to Capybara, uh, to Capybara, which is used in Ruby? 
Uh, I haven't actually worked with it in Ruby. Um, I would have to go and have a look. Um, be ha I mean, if it conforms to the spec, um, because there is effectively a, a specification behind all of this that if you want to be the official implementation of Cucumber, which is the general suite of tools, you have to adhere to a set of guidelines and a set of rules and standards. And BHAT is the official implementation of that within PHP. So if they both adhere to the same spec, then effectively there wouldn't be a lot stopping you from taking a feature file like this and you know implementing it in Ruby as well. Um, it depends if it's a scenario tool or a spec BDD tool. The spec BDD tools do, uh, do work a lot differently. But scenario BDD tools, there's no reason why you couldn't take this feature file and implement it in another language if it was, uh, you know, if it was conforming to the, um, the Gherkin spec. Um, there's no reason why you couldn't. Um, but as for how they directly compare, I'm afraid I can't answer that because I've not used uh, any of the Ruby tools. Um, but a lot of this stuff did originate in, in Ruby land. Um, I just haven't used it, I'm afraid. All right, then. Uh, also, uh, like there were a couple of people who joined the webinar a little late after you had started off. So for them, could you just do a quick recap of the um, uh, of the earlier portion of your talk uh, where you were talking about testing and TDD versus BDD? Yeah, uh, I'll probably actually go. It's probably easy to go back through it on the slides, um, which is uh, there we are. yeah. So for yeah, for those people. Um, Test-driven development sort of versus behavior-driven development, they're not really sort of in, they're not, they don't go head to head um, like some people might think. Um, they are the sort of the same, but behavior-driven development sort of considers a broader audience. So test-driven development focuses more on developers and the code that's being written, whereas behavior-driven development considers, you know, the larger audience and more people that are affected by it. Um, Behavior-driven development emerged from test-driven development, so it kind of it was born from it, and it's like you know the next evolution um, and the next generation of testing. Um, so they consider BDD to be test-driven development done right, um, and what they mean by that is, or anyone means by this really, is that if you're doing test-driven development correctly, you're effectively doing behavior-driven development because you should be you know having the conversations. So the sort of the really key summary to this is that test-driven development is building the thing right. It's building it with you know, really well-structured code and best practices and making sure that the code itself is well-structured, well-formed, is readable and all that side of things. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're building the right thing, which is what behavior-driven development is about. That's about building the thing that fits the business value that you're trying to achieve. So it doesn't care too much about how it works under the surface. It just makes sure that you're building the right thing, and then you can use test-driven development behind that to make sure that it's built well at the same time. Does that cover that? Yes, that that does very succinctly cover that up. Uh, so, uh, all right, so we have one more question here, and before I take that up once again, I think we're moving towards the end of the session, and if any of our audience have any more questions, now would be the time to type them in. All right, so the next question that I have here is that uh, BHAT is now at the core of Drupal 8, and uh, what is the extra feature does it provide to have BHAT at the core of Drupal 8 rather than the, using BHAT on Drupal 7 when it was not a part of the core? Um, I haven't, I'm not a Drupal programmer myself, but knowing the integrations that they've got, um, I personally, I work with Symfony, um, which I know Drupal uses a lot of the Symfony components under the surface now um, yes. with Drupal 8. Um, I couldn't tell you specifics, but if there's anything I know about the integrations that I've seen with BHAT, is that they the process of developing with the two, the setup is just a lot easier. So, for example, if I'm working with it with Symfony, I can install a package that basically bridges the gap between the two, and they just work much easier together. I don't have to do a lot of the setup for it. It's just there and ready to go. That's the biggest part of this, because ultimately under the surface, there's not a huge amount that BHAT does, and um, BHAT does leave it to plugins to do a lot of the things, you know, or for you to write things. It doesn't have a lot of logic behind it that drives, you know, exactly how things should work. It kind of leaves that up to you because it's just a framework. It just allows you to do whatever you need to do with it. So with Drupal 8, I would imagine that it's basically just set up, ready to go, and your ability to get started with BHAT is going to be much less of a roadblock as if you had to you know, install it yourself and make sure that it can talk to the database properly and all that sort of side of things as well. Um, that would probably be one of the, the big ones, I imagine. All right, great. 
so uh, another question that we have here is what do you use to automate the test in the browser where the mouse clicked on the right parts of the page uh, that is a tool called selenium um, if you look at bhat.yaml here further down it's called selenium 2 spelled like that um, all of this code is on github as well um, so uh, I can share the link to that if you want to go and look at this. Um, it does rely on Docker, but it's everything set up so you can you know, type a simple command and it will be up and running. But it's a tool called Selenium, and effectively that's a, it's a browser driver, and you can tell it if you want to use Firefox or, Safari, uh, or Chrome or you know, different types of browsers to be able to say, I want to load that browser, um, and I want to be able to give these commands to it. Um, but under the surface, um, if you've got the Mink extension installed for Bhat, it comes with Selenium 2 support, you just need to point it to the right place and it will be able to talk to Selenium and do it all for you automatically. Um, there's not an awful lot that you need to do. All you need to do under the surface is just make sure that you are you know, visiting URLs and clicking buttons. And then if, you're loaded, if you've loaded uh, Selenium, Mink will handle that in Selenium. But if not, it will use just a different browser under the surface um, without having to go through you know, a, full, a full browser. Does that answer the question? Yes, that does. Uh, all right. So I think with that, we have come to the end of all the questions from the users. And I think in the end, if you would just, let's say, to wrap it up, if you were to give like a couple of pointers for uh, good writing good user stories before development, what would they be? Like, let's say, two or three quick pointers. Okay. Um, I would say the first one would be always make sure you write your feed files before you've started coding. If you started writing code or even thinking about code, it's kind of already too late. Um, but if you make sure you have those conversations, it's like a second point, make sure you have those conversations with other people, with the other stakeholders, they won't talk like a browser. They won't say, I click on the button to do this. They will say, I add the product to the basket. And it's those key little phrases that you need to pick up on. And if you're still struggling, um, I wrote a blog post about this that I can share as well. But if you're still struggling with this kind of thing, try and consider, well, how would, how would this work in real life? Or how would this work via an app? Because if I write a feature that says, you know, and I go to this URL, well, that's not going to work if I've got a mobile app, because mobile apps don't use URLs. They use, you know, view layers and that kind of thing. So always consider, how could, could this feature file that I'm writing be used to test, say, a mobile app or a command line application? Or... Does it describe me going into like a physical presence and doing this for real? Because if I'm in a physical store, I don't actually click on buttons to add things to my basket. I take the item and I put it in my basket. So those are kind of a few things I'd recommend. It's always trying to think about it from a different aspect. All right. So I think with that, we've come to the end of today's session. And I would like to thank Matt for presenting uh, presenting this session so brilliantly. And I would also like to thank all our audience for being such patient listeners and such engaging listeners for us and so with that we have come to the last webinar of this year uh, and uh, we will definitely have more webinars for you next year and all of the and Matt's session including his presentation and all the resources that he shared will be in your inbox uh, will be in your inbox soon so with that I would like to wish Matt and all our audience a very happy holidays and we will see you next year thank you Thank you very much. Happy holidays.